my name is Afaksad, uh, Afaksad Chege. I, I serve at a PCA Kirigiti Parish. Uh, we, like we, we mentioned uh, last week, we, we just thought it's, it's important for uh, many of us to be empowered in the area of preaching uh, because uh, preaching has been made to be something uh, that it is not. And uh, the best way for us to know what really uh, what preaching is really about, uh, we, we only go back to the Bible, uh, the only uh, book that God gave us as, as our reference. And so today we are going to be looking at expository preaching. That sounds like a, uh, like a vocabulary for some of you, uh, but I'm sure uh, our speaker will try and, and, and just show us how simple that is. Uh, last week, we began with introduction to preaching with the Reverend Nelson Gadairo, and those of you who are there were really blessed. Um, uh, you mentioned that, and we are going to be having a, a recorded version uh, of, uh, of, of that. Uh, actually, it's already on our YouTube channel. For those of you who have gone there, you find our, uh, the session recorded uh, last, uh, last week's session, and so you can follow it up there. And we are still recording today's uh, session. Uh, so you can you can have this uh, in your library uh, for reference. And so today we are having expository preaching and maybe towards the end I'll be talking about the sessions that we'll have uh, in the future. So I want to welcome all of you, uh, those of you who come from Kirigiti Parish, uh, those of you who come from uh, outside Kirigiti Parish, outside Kiambu Presbytery. I have had many people asking me to send me the link uh, who are not even PCA members. It is such a great blessing uh, because what really defines us uh, is, is, is the word of God, not really uh, the name that, that we, are, we abide by uh, while we are here on earth. Uh, before I uh, call the speaker, I invite the speaker to, uh, to go ahead and guide us. Um, just to request that uh, if you have any question, I would request that you uh, send a message on chat. And uh, we are going to sample a few questions that will be handled here uh, because we will not be able to handle many. Uh, we hope to be out of uh, this place, say by around eight or maybe five minutes past eight, we hope to have finished. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, as the speaker continues, just uh, throw your message uh, on chat. And so we are going to retrieve your, your question from there. And so uh, our brother who speaks to us today is, is, a, is a very dear brother and uh, he's a dear brother because of, uh, of how he, he loves the truth. Uh, he can do many things for the truth and he inspires me for that. And he will be talking to us about guarding the truth today and handling God's word correctly as he guides us through expository preaching. His name is uh, Reverend Wilson Minor uh, from Monyange Parish. So I, I just want us to uh, straight away uh, go ahead and uh, invite Mchungaji uh, so that uh, he will take it up from here. Karibu sana, Reverend, and uh, God with you. Amen. Amen. So, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm clear. Rev, Naniskia? Yes, Nakuskia. Sijui kama ni 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 mtambo yangu ndiyo hainanga volume ama ama ni zote. Ya, maybe uneza ungeza volume kitoko tu. Let me see. I think my volume is highest. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. Yeah, sawa. You, 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 maybe you talk to the healing. Ah, sa -sawa. I hope I will be audible enough. Yes. Yes. Sawa, sawa. So good evening, everyone. As Trevor has said, my name is Wilson Maina. And I love the Lord for his grace and mercies. His saving grace has been with me and upon me. This evening, I'm glad to join in this great uh, endeavor of sharing God's word and seeing how we can best share God's word. And uh, maybe before we begin, uh, I want to say asante to Rev and the parish and above all to God for entrusting me with such a, a privilege of sharing what expository preaching is and to to build on what Reverend Nelson did for the previous time. Uh, before we do that, I would want to read God's word from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, and I will read from verse 1 to verse 8. <clears throat> Let's hear the reading of God's word. And all the people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. 
So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they had on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform and they, that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mati, Mativia, Shema, and Anaia, Uria, Hilkia, and Messia. On his right hand, Pedaia, Mishael, Malchija, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, Meshula on his left hand, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he opened it all to the people as the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God of all the people, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their hands and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Joshua, Bani, Sherabia, Jamin, Akub, Shebetai, Hodia, Messiah, Kelita, Ezariah, Jazobad, Hanan, Eliah, the Revites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. And verse 8, I would want us to concentrate on this. They read from the book of the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that this evening as we study together on the expository preaching, you would be gracious by your spirit to help us understand, to learn that which you would want us to learn, and that your name will be glorified. Give me utterance, give us concentration, and above all, let your name be honored. This is our prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so last time, uh, Reverend Nelson was with us and he was introducing us to preaching and giving us a definition to preaching. And we got, a, if I may remember, we got a simple definition and a longer definition that preaching is the official public proclamation of the word. And he quote one, and he said, the longer one, that preaching is the official ministerial public proclamation, explanation, illustration, and application of the word of God written as it reveals Christ to the church and to the world. And building on that, is where we are coming in now into what we call expository preaching. Because uh, we were also taught that preaching is not giving a speech. Preaching is not giving a testimony. Preaching is not, we were told all what preaching is not. And as we try to understand what exactly is preaching, I, I got a quote from somewhere it is the, the, in the book, it was not told who could, who said it, but it said, never belittle preaching. Never look down upon preaching. If you are a preacher, be a preacher, not a storyteller, not an entertainer, not a motivational speaker. Be a preacher. And as we look into what it means to be a preacher, we, we have different kinds of preachings, different people preach to a dynamic God, and therefore we have different kinds of sermons that, are, that go around. One, we might have somebody taking a whole, through a whole book. You start with the, the book of Genesis, and you preach all through the chapters of Genesis, you go to the next book of Exodus, and you move on and move on, and some other people will just move randomly, picking topics faithfully from scriptures. Say we are teaching about family, teaching about 
business from the Bible and looking at different topics. Others will follow the lectionary as uh, most of you, I, I, I guess, are Presbyterians from the PCA and we've been following the lectionary from the Christian Education Department, I hope so. And we follow different events. The church calendar, right now we are, we are in, the, in the few Sundays after the resurrection. Soon we shall be in the resurrection Sunday. Previously we were in the Easter season. Previously we, we were in the Christmas season. You may choose to preach uh, from the church calendar. And other times we just choose themes randomly. Maybe you're invited to preach and you're asked to preach about uh, giving. You ask to preach about health, and differently we we handle scripture differently. Maybe because we are dynamic, maybe because we are created differently, maybe because we have seen others doing so. But today I want us to focus on uh, expository preaching and understand what exactly is this expository preaching, as the word as we hear the word ex expository has the word expose in it, tries or expository preaching is conveying God's message faithfully from scriptures. As we read in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 8, it has said they read from the book. And when they say from the book, we are talking about the Old Testament. They, re they read from the book of the law from the law of God clearly and they give sense so that the people understood the reading. So what is being exposed is God's word. Not my word, not the preacher's thoughts, not what the people would want to hear, but the word of God as written in scriptures. And here we must distinguish, or we, we must define what the word of God is. The word of God is scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament as revealed. The word of God is not a dream I had yesterday. The word of God is not a vision I claim to have had yesterday. The word of God is not God spoke to me. The word of God is what is written in the Bible. So when we talk of experience, Exposing God's truth as it is in the Bible, that is what we call expository preaching. Giving sense to God's word so that people may understand. And you do not give sense to God's word from what you think. Scriptures interpret scriptures. As we talk of expository preaching, uh, I would want us to use the word exegesis meaning digging meaning out of the text rather than I suggest is coming with a thought and forcing it in the text. What do I mean by forcing something in the text? I am a member of PCA Kirigiti. I have seen somebody, somebody has annoyed me because they gossiped or something like that. And I've been given an opportunity to preach. So everything I'm thinking, I'm thinking, how, what do I talk about gossip? So I will force all scriptures to, to come and talk about gossip. Not because it is what the Bible says, but because it's what my mind tells me. That is forcing information on the text. Up again is that expository preaching, or what I call exegesis, conveys information or explains what is in the text, let the text speak. It could also mean to bring out meaning of the text. Expository preaching among what we call the reformed circles, and uh, those of you who belong to the PCA know that PCA is a reformed church, among the reformed circles, we define these as preaching of God's word faithfully and fully. Exegesis is 
preaching or expository preaching is preaching God's word from the Bible faithfully and fully. So we begin there. What, what is better or good is to preach verse, word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And as we begin, in, as we begin to, to venture into this, we also understand that the Bible is one basic story. The story, his story, Christ's story. And therefore, what the expositor is doing mainly is showing Christ from the scriptures. Is showing Christ from scriptures. We must note that the Bible was not uh, originally written to the person you are preaching on a Sunday morning or in a fellowship meeting. Uh, the fact that the Bible is written through a period of many years to different audience with different experiences, uh, but the message of God remains the same faithfully. Therefore, I want us to, to, to see how then do I, how then am I able to do uh, this uh, expository preaching? How am I able to expose scriptures faithfully? Because the word here is not only exposing scriptures, it is faithfully exposing scriptures. It is faithfully preaching. Because so many people preach and everybody claims to be preaching faithfully. But how do we tell now that we are doing faithful preaching? I would want us to, to go through a few steps of how to go about this. And uh, one of the things that uh, I will say before we, we go to the steps is that you cannot preach if you do not know your Bible. You cannot preach if you do not know your Bible. Take an example of a preacher is like a postman. A preacher is like a messenger. When, when you, you put a letter in the post office, the post office is, delivers a letter, not a letter that they wrote, but a letter that was written by someone else, and they will do it faithfully. They do not open and write up some other things. The message is delivered without altering. So we are messengers of God's word. And so what we try to do, because this message is not sealed in an envelope, rather it is opened in the pages of the Bible, we want to remain as faithful as possible to the message. So the 10 steps, I want to, to talk about a few steps. One, the interpretation of God's word starts with prayer. Remember, it is God's word, not my word, not the church's word, not the preacher's word. It is God's word. And therefore, we, the preacher, the expositor, the exegete, must begin by prayer, requiring God's leading and guidance. So it is very important for you, the expositor, to be prayerful. And by prayerful, you are one acknowledging whose word it is. It is God's word. I always tend to think of God's word as uh, uh, with an example of any one of us being given an, an opportunity to, to deliver the president's speech. And we've seen it being a, a controversy in Kenya. Who will read the president's speech? Is it the minister? Is it the deputy president? Who will read the speech? And there's no one who has ever set aside. Once you're given the script of the president's speech, you don't shove it aside and start giving your own information. So here, we are trying to be faithful to the king's, not, not president, to the king's message. And the king here is God. And therefore, we can only do that prayer free, seeking God and praying 
that he would lead us. Number two, we must identify the text. Remember, we said it is if it was possible and what is recommended, if you have a pulpit day in, day out, most of us do not have that privilege because you are preaching once in a month or different congregations every Sunday. If you're standing in a pulpit, you would choose a text because number two is identifying the text. You would easily choose a text that I will handle the book of John, the gospel of John through my preaching through the year. Unfortunately, most of us don't have that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that privilege of choosing or what to uh, the text that you can you can do a whole book through the year. If you're able to do that, praise the Lord. How do you choose the text? In most of the cases, we are left at the uh, at, at, at the masses that just come preach to us, talk to us about Easter, talk to us about uh, whatever is coming up, and you're not given a text. So what is easy? There is a way out. Most of the people will have their pet summons. I love preaching Micah chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. So everybody, every other time I'm invited, it's here. I'll just go and preach. That is wrong. That is laziness. That is actually unfaithfulness to God's word. So you need to, to choose a text or to come to the text, to the Bible, considering so many factors that are, that are there. One, as I said, it might be it's in the church calendar. The church might be going through a series of preachings. You might be privileged to be the lead preacher and the only preacher in that church, so you can be able to go through a whole book. You might be asked to preach on a topic. So that's, that's not you choosing the text. But then you come to the scriptures and you want to preach on uh, salvation and you want to go to, to John. So you, you, you pick a text. John 3.16, for God. So you go and choose John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's where you begin. But is that enough? You may now wake up in the morning, go to the pulpit and tell people, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is every, anyone can do that. So one, you identify the text. And I say the easiest thing is to start, if you're doing the book of John, is to start from John chapter one, verse one, and you do word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. But in this case, most of us don't have that, that privilege of, being able to, to go through the whole book with the same congregation or the same audience. So we find ourselves preaching, as I said, from different topics, different themes, different chapters, different seasons. So number two, as you identify that text, you also look for what we call the general context. When I use the word context, I mean the setting of that text. The study of who wrote, I am preaching John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3 is found in the book of John. Who wrote the book of John? Is it John the Baptist? Is it John the disciple? Which John wrote the book of John? So you need to understand who is this John who is writing to us? How will you know that? Hard work. You study, you research, you read. You read. Preaching is hard work. And especially expository preaching is hard work. So you need to understand who is the author. When did he write? I am preaching in the 21st century. When was the book of John written? Was it in the first century? Was it in the second century? Who were the audience? Who was John writing to? 
the gospel of john is being written to the church in the first century who is paul writing when he writes to the romans he's writing to the church in rome christians in rome so you need to understand who is the audience that is what we call the historical background of the book its purpose for being written why was it written? Why, why, why was John writing to us that we may believe? Why was Luke writing to us? Why was Matthew writing? These people were writing letters. They were writing gospels. These people are writing narratives. Why are they writing these narratives? So it is important for you to have a basic knowledge about your Bible and I think some of this knowledge was given to us right from primary school, types of literature in every book, the poetry, the epistles, the gospels, things like that. So first you identify the general context, the author, the date, the audience, the general message of the book, because generally this author is trying to communicate something. Then number three, number four, we go to the literary context, literally, literary context. This has two main emphasis. How does our passage connect to what comes before it and after it? We have a text here, John 3, 16. But remember, this is verse 16 of John chapter 3. There is verse 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, and so forth. There is chapter 2, there is chapter 1. How does that verse connect to those chapters? How does God love the world that he gave only begotten son relate to John chapter 1 that the word was God and became flesh? How does it connect to chapter 3, verse 17, 18, 19, chapter 4? How does it connect? You need to understand how is this verse connected? Because this is where we avoid one verse preachers. For God so loved the world. God loves the world. And you preach a whole the intent was not to preach on that. You need to understand where is the author going with this specific text. Therefore, you look at the literal context. So how does it connect to, to, to what comes before and what comes after? The literal context, the literal context also helps us to understand how does our passage connect to similar ideas in the rest of the book? Is there anywhere else that the, the book of John is talking about the love of God, the giving of his only son, the son? And you need to identify those, those, those places where it is relating in the book of John. And then we go to, to a big word here, number five, that is called the, the lexical grammatical context. Generally, don't mind the big word lexical grammatical. It is the study of the specific words, phrases, sentences, within that passage. The study of specific words, phrases, sentences within the passage. Sometimes you will note that a passage will repeat several, sent several words. Several words are, 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 are repeated. For example, in Nehemiah chapter eight, where we have read, you will find the word law, the book of the law, the book of the law, the book of the law repeated. So you need to note those keywords and phrases. These are uh, might work as signs or calls that may have a deeper meaning to, than the superficial meaning. At this point, you are able, you now go to deeper study. You can get, you can start by getting different versions of the English Bible because most of us will use the English Bible. You can put a copy of the NIV, you can put a copy of the ESV, you can have a copy of the King James, 
those of you who are privileged to uh, maybe to understand the, the original languages, you can check out. Those of you who do not, you've not learned, you can still use other materials. There are books called lexicons. There are books that are available. Some of them are even available online. You can start studying those specific words. For God so loved the world. When that verse is using the word world, does it mean the earth? What is the world in this context? So you study those specific words. So, for God so loved. Does so here just mean so much in terms of uh, the quantity of love that God loved? For God so loved, loved so much. Or does it mean so God loved the world in this manner? It is so in this manner. So you, you need to study word by word. What is this word? I read for God so loved the world. Take the word for. Study it in your English. Look, look at different versions of the Bible. How are they using this word? Look at, study that word even in, in, in different languages. Sometimes you can even take your mother tongue Bible and read how, how is it translating this verse. Because again, these people who, who translated the Bible went to, to the original languages. So you need to, to have a deeper, you, you look at the original words, you look at comparing different translations and, and uh, versions of the Bible for meanings of the word brought forth by different translators. And the goal of this is to bring you closer to that statement. Then six, number six, we look at what we call the cultural context. This is the study of cultural factors. That is ideas, customs, the geography. When we say that Jesus uh, left Judea and went to Galilee, what was the implication of that? He, he found a woman, that is John chapter four now, he found a woman sitting by the well. Why did he have to, to pass through Samaria? Take a map and, and look at that. The cultural context, the cultural implications. Why was the woman of, at the well not comfortable? Why was she not comfortable to speak to Jesus? Why did she say that I am a Samaritan, you're, you're a Jew? You can even go to the, to the internet and look for some good sites that can tell you what is the difference between a Jew and a Samaritan? What exactly is going on? What is exactly going on, uh, the cultural implication? As, as you, you look at the cultural context, you would seek to explain a bit about, uh, for example, when, uh, for example, we are looking at John chapter, chapter 3, verse 16. When we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What, what, is, the what is the begotten son? And as as you study the cultural context, you will understand that some of these things have greater meaning to some cultures than they have in other cultures. The original culture, again, I jump to, to chapter four, the woman at the well. When the woman at the well is speaking to a Jew, it has a cultural implication that I, a Kenyan Kikuyu, may not understand unless I study it. And remember, this is not, you, you're not studying this to go and uh, to take it to the pulpit. This is study for you as you prepare, as you exegete, as you expose uh, the, 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 the word of God. As you look at the cultural context, you move now to the larger picture and you look at the biblical context. Remember I said that the word of God is one. It is his story, the story of Jesus. So how does the book of John fit in with Genesis chapter 1? How does the begotten son who saves the world connected to Genesis chapter 1, to Revelation chapter 12? How, is it in, how, how does it come in? So as you look at the biblical context, you, you study parallel passages in our text, the Bible, you, you, you look at, sometimes the Old Testament will quote, the New, the New Testament will quote the Old Testament. You look at the biblical context. 
how does how does it fit in? Because it is a big part, is a small part of the bigger picture. It's like you've taken out a brick out of a big wall. So you need to look at how is this brick coming in in these walls. For for the limitation of of, of uh, the mode of um, media that you're using, we would have looked. Uh, probably if we had the, the luxury of drawing, we would have looked at how Revelation starts with, from the book of Genesis and continues to unveil. It's one story that, that grows and as, as it grows, it opens up and becomes more clear right from the fall to the promise of a redeemer, to the coming of the redeemer and to the establish, establishment of the redeemed people of God and they are waiting redemption of God. And therefore, as you look at the larger biblical context, you need to understand that no verse stands alone. It is part of look at the biblical text, and then you move and look at the theological context. In this step, we start to ask ourselves, what are the doctrinal issues? What are the teachings that are in this verse? Most of us are, are opposed. Most of us are, I don't know if it's by design. Most of us don't want to hear the word theology or doctrine. Unfortunately, I always say that everybody has a, doc, a, a theology. The question is whether it is good or bad. When we talk of theologies, we are talking of key teachings, doctrines, key teachings of the Bible. For God so loved the world. You can even look at that from the point of the, the doctrine of God, the character of God. Is it talking about the character of God? Love. How does God love the world? And as you look at all that, you're able to, to, to pick doctrinal issues we see in the text. Mind you, here you are still in your study. You're just studying, so you're thinking this is about God. This is about the world. This is about love. So you are picking out doctrinal issues that you see in the text. And key among the theological issues in every text is the message of Christ. It's the message of Christ. So for me, it is always where is Christ here? Christ is everywhere both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I think there is no text that is complete without seeing Christ in it. Some of you may say that's an extra, but I think it's all about Christ. Christ is portrayed either as the king, the priest, the prophet, but ultimately the king, Christ is, re, is revealed in scripture as the Christ, the Messiah. An example is right from Genesis chapter one, that the, the, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent, right there. As you look at David, your kingdom shall be everlasting. That is the Psalms. And as you move on, then as, as you look at all that, as you come to all that, you, you're also now, taking into consideration study. You're taking, this, you're taking this scripture and you're studying it, looking at what have other writers, what have other preachers, what have other good writers. And I hope uh, Reverend Alfatsad will organize for us one of these days to know who are the good preachers and who are the bad preachers. Yeah, as soon as possible, Mchungaji. Please do that, because we don't want people uh, looking for TDJs and saying that they are good preachers preaching on a, on a topic. So you should be able to, to look at who are the faithful men and women who have, uh, who are the faithful men who have handled God's word before? Those people, because we know some of, as Rev has promised to, to, to do that for us, that you need to, to look at faithful writers, people who have, inter, inter, who have interacted with the text, uh, 
exegeted it, exposed it, written about it, maybe in commentaries, maybe in books. Like uh, personally, I've been reading this. I hope you can you can see this. This is a book called Word Centered Church by one of uh, a man called Jonathan Lehman and other 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 books. They are full on my table. I wish I would show you. So as you study the word of God, you, you want to see on that specific text, what have other people said? You're looking at what we call the commentaries. What are commentaries saying? As a rule, I have a rule with myself that I will always go to a very, very old commentator called Matthew Henry. He's a favorite for me. Maybe you have your favorite. What is he saying about that text? You're not copying what we call copy paste we are not copying and pasting what he has said you are studying what that other person has written and as you chew that as you chew that we can borrow from the animals that that chew cards right now what we are doing is eating and eating and eating and eating then for me it is always after i have done all that i will pause like a uh, I, I'm a farmer, I, I have some sheep. So I, I always see that after they eat and eat and eat, in the afternoon, they will lie down and start chewing cud. Like cows, they will chew cud. At this moment, I will also pause and now start thinking slowly through it, reading, reading the text, going through my notes. I've been doing a lot of scribbling, writing, writing, so I will go back to my notes. And at that point, I will now start looking at the application. At the application. In this step, this is, uh, this is now coming after, after we've done the theological context. Now we are doing the application. Unfortunately, again, I will point this out. Most of us begin with application. We apply, then we look for scriptures to, uh, to justify our application. Here, you've studied the word of God. You've gleaned out, you've, you've been able to pull out truth from scriptures. And now you have this concentrated truth in your hand. You've now realized John is talking to the believers about how God demonstrated his love to the world by giving Jesus Christ, who is his only son. And so I ask myself now, what does this mean for my congregation? What does this mean for us in the 21st century? What does this mean to the Christian seated in Munyange Church or Kerigiti Church or that other congregation? What does it mean to those students that I'm supposed to, pay, to share a devotional on so you're able now to take this truth and now you want to apply it remember you've not gotten the text because you know some things that somebody told you you are getting the truth of god's word and now bringing it to the lives of, of people and again this this brings us back to our to our first step prayer this requires a lot of prayer and, and uh, guidance from God. Application is unpackaging that truth and exposing it to today's hearing. It's taking a letter that was written in the first century and bringing it to the 21st century and making it relevant to them. So how you do that? You need to be sensitive to the culture you're speaking to. You need to be sensitive to the audience you're speaking to. You need to be sensitive to the language that you use. You cannot come and just because you're speaking to the congregation and tell them that I was with my Greek book and it told me, and you start dropping difficult and heavy Greek vocabulary. And this is where uh, Reverend Nelson was warning us last time about not making the sermon about yourself. What we do most of the time is that we spend uh, 20 minutes applying in the beginning and we just we just throw words from scripture well it is supposed to be vice versa 
you expose scripture and apply it. As you're getting the application, remember this is not in the pulpit. You're still in your study desk. As you apply it, now you see it again. You will chew card again. You will sit down again and chew card. You will bring out what has been in your heart and in your mind. And now you organize your sermon. You do what is called developing an outline. Most people, we want to, to preach a sermon that has an introduction, the main points, and a conclusion. As they always say, stand up, tell us what you want to tell us, tell us what you uh, tell us what you have come, to. tell us what you want to tell us. Number one, tell us what you are telling us, and lastly, tell us what you told us. What does that mean? It means that you're coming to preach one thing to the people. And I'm always repeating this. You've come to preach Christ to the people. What is that thing about Christ? What is that thing about the people of Christ that you want to speak to them? All these points that you will develop, all these illustrations that you will bring, all these things that you bring in, must point us to that one thing. The preacher, the expositor, the expository sermon does not leave the audience, does not leave uh, the congregation remembering your story. Someone ilikuwa mzuri sana. Kwanza your story. It leaves the congregation remembering God's word. And that is why I love the word expository preaching. And I, 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 I want to just cut the word expose. You are exposing God's word to the people. And so you will begin again by prayer. As you pray, you identify your text. You look for the context, the date, the author, the audience. You look at the literal context. What are the verses above and below? What are the verses that surround what I'm preaching? Then you look at uh, the specific words and phrases from that text. Then you will look at the cultural context. Then you will go to the larger biblical context, remembering the Bible is his story, the story of Christ. Then you look at the, the doctrinal issues, the theological context, the, the teachings, what I call the bones in the meat. Then you come to the application. Remember, this is in your study room, the application. Then you develop an outline. That means. You've taken uh, the Bible and you've taken God's word from the Bible. That is expository preaching. You've not come with your thoughts. You've not come with a sermon that you made up when you were on the way and forced it in the Bible. Rather, you've let the word of God come to you so that you can give it to the people. What are some of the dangers or some of the pitfalls that an expositor can fall into? One is misleading the text. Some people want to, to pick a text and direct it where it does not go. You want to pick John 3.16 and tell us, for God so loved the world, and you want to tell us that this, is, this means that God loved the world so much. I wonder what the Apostle Paul would say with that, that says that when we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us. Two is distortion of the text. Making the text say what you want it to say. That is what we call a suggestion. Three is contradicting 
the text. Some people want to justify wrongs from scriptures. Today, I had an experience with someone who was justifying uh, drinking, and they said, Paul told Timothy to take a little for the stomach. So you are taking scriptures and contradicting the larger biblical truth. Number four is what we call subjectism. Subjectivism. You come with your baggage to the pulpit. I don't like the way the church is being run. So I have an opportunity in the pulpit to hammer people. You come with your unfinished business on the pulpit. That is wrong. The other thing is unpreparedness and overconfidence. The few things that we talked about an expository sermon or expository preaching needs hard work. You cannot tell me that you're doing an expository sermon, a sermon that you are told to preach in the morning and you have prepared well. Expository preaching needs time, preparation, study, prayer, and commitment. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, I want once again to repeat that the best way to do this is to take your Bible. If you want to preach a whole book, go word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Unfortunately, we do not have that privilege, most of us, especially those of us who are PCEA. Because you'll find yourself preaching, you're responsible for five congregations and you are the sole preacher. So as you do that, you may do it, it's hard work, but most of the time you'll find yourself preaching from the church calendar or, or, or from the, the, the calendar in the years. Or you may find yourself doing thematic preaching or you may find yourself doing topical sermons. Whatever sermon you're going to preach, preach it from the Bible and not vice versa. Do not preach into the Bible. Preach from the Bible. I think I would want to pause at that for now. Rev, I would want to pause at that for now and maybe respond to, to questions on the chat. What are the dangers of one verse preaching? Rev, what, what do you think? Yes, exactly, exactly that. Yeah, there is a, yeah, we, we really appreciate the far that we have gone. Yes, there is that question. And uh, there's also someone asking how, how long uh, someone should be, I think. I think that's what they're trying to ask, whether it should be 30 minutes, one hour. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll respond to that by saying, what are the dangers of one verse preaching? I, I think somewhere I mentioned it, that the, the, the danger is falling into false teachings. And the one thing that you would do is to preach into the Bible rather than out of the Bible. If you read the, the letters of Paul and the other writers, you find them responding to so many false teachings that are going on. And I, I, I wonder what, if the apostles lived today, how many heresies and false teachings they would respond to. Because one verse preaching deviates from the totality of biblical truth. One verse preaching deviates from biblical truth. It's like that funny story that is given of a, a person who, who was just opening the Bible randomly and doing what that verse had said. And it is said that he, he opened that verse that says, and Judas went and, went and hung himself. And so he woke up and went and hung himself. That is how you will always be hanging Christians. You'll always be speaking up from one verse and you run with that verse and you find yourself preaching. And, and some, of, some of these 
Some of these verses we've always preached them so wrongly. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah, the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord, and we want to kill everything in our lives so that we may see the Lord. And it was just showing the time that King Isaiah, uh, King Uzziah died, the year that Isaiah was called. And we want to make a whole sermon of it. What you'll find doing is that most of the times when you pick one verse, that verse is not what you are preaching. You have your own sermon that you came with. And so you are using this verse as a hook to hang all your sermons. So I think the danger is false teachings, going into false teachings, going into to not the gospel, preaching other gospels, as Paul would call it, other gospels. And there is only one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I think I would I would respond to that that way. Um, what should what time should what time should you consider the time giving given to preach? Yes, you should, because preaching. Uh, when we go, there are different instances of preaching, but I want to talk of congregational worship, where preaching is the is the climax of worship. We have so many other things going around. We have singing. We have um, we have prayer, corporate prayer. We have uh, other things that are going on in the church. And as you preach to these people, your 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 sermon. I always say, uh, there's a friend of mine who says, spend forty minutes uh, preparing for a sermon. You will preach it for three hours. Spend three hours preparing for a sermon. You preach it for for forty minutes. The the longer the much time that you use to prepare will be able to show you the truth in simplicity and be able to give it to the people. What determines the time? Where are you preaching? You've been given a devotion or to give a devotion on a, a graduation. You don't want to preach for a whole hour or two hours in a graduation ceremony. Corporate worship on Sunday. How many services do we have? We have three services in that congregation. Again, you need to watch on time. Uh, we have to uh, here where I, I, I minister. We have only one, one, uh, one service. But again, I don't want to, to stand in the pulpit for two hours. Uh, this psychology people will get tired and things like that. You will end up becoming an entertainer because people are tired and you want them to to keep awake. So you become a JJ or a Morada, something that will entertain people before they sleep. So I think you need to to watch on time. I don't want to limit you and say that a, a sermon should be 20 minutes or, or 40 minutes, but personally, I always struggle between 30 to 40 minutes uh, as I preach, and I feel comfortable with 30 to 40 minutes. There are people I, I listen to. I have preachers that preach for two hours, and I am just listening, and they are not giving vituko. They are people who are exposing God's word in truth, and you don't want to, them to see it. But I think... Rev, I think we, we also need to train ourselves on listening to sermons. Sure. Because most of us are entertained. We love uh, that guy who will come and give us stories of how he did it. We love the guy who will make us laugh. But I wish we would learn to listen to truth and we are, we are held by the truth. If, if you read uh, the story of this young man called Eutychus in the Bible, Paul was, was preaching a whole night until the young man dozed and fell off. People would transnight, people would stand in the church listening to a sermon for a whole night. Uh, and they would not get tired. They would come back the following day because they love the word of God. Uh, we have different things that make us want to, to preach for long, but personally I'm comfortable with 25, 30, 40 minutes, I'm always comfortable with that. But does the length of your sermon preaching matter? What is the standard time that would suit the congregation? Again, as I said, that one I said, how many verses should one put refer to during preaching apart from the key verses? <laughs> Stick to your text. Stick to your text. Expose your text. Unless those verses are related to that text don't don't uh, don't drown people in the bible 
remain to your text John 3:16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and then uh, you can look at uh, if there are relevant verses that shows us how the love of God is manifested to us while you are still seeing us Christ died for us and uh, uh, there are people who know how to quote the bible so much and it's not a time to show you a your flores and knowledge of the Bible. So just be, be simple, quote what is necessary. Again, remember we talked of the, the, biblical, the biblical context that says, study the parallel passages to the text in other parts of the Bible, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, and see how they relate. So I think uh, don't, don't overdo. And somebody would say, don't, don't suffocate people with the Bible. So Rev, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend. And, and maybe just to add briefly on uh, the one verse uh, speaking, uh, the dangers mm -hmm. of it. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, like you said, the, the danger here is to separate that text from where it is. Uh, like assume that there are no other verses existing uh, before and after. So like, yeah. for example, that you're giving us, John 3.16, you can very comfortably preach from that verse alone as long as you appreciate the context. Yeah. And as, as long as you appreciate the 10 points that you took us through, cultural context, yeah. biblical context, you know, after you have done that work thoroughly, you can still give justice to that one verse. But yeah. if you just take that one verse and ignore the whole Bible, ignore the whole chapter, ignore, ignore all the other verses, and then give your stories about you know how God loved uh, the world, then that, that would be dangerous. Yeah, that would be dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, is, yes. And Rev, yes, to add on on uh, on uh, one verse, you would be so surprised that you can preach a whole year on John three sixteen. Oh yeah. And you're not repeating. Very true. Yeah. So it, it's about the context. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. The great, the greatest expositors uh, would do that. You know, J.C. Ryle, Martin Lloyd yeah, Jones, yeah, yeah, yeah. MacArthur. Yeah, MacArthur. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm feeling so limited today because I'm, I'm. I'm yeah. I'm, <laughs> I can, I, I can understand. I, I zoomed. <laughs> You, zoom, you zoomed in. I, I don't know whether it's zooming yeah, in or not. I yeah, had to I, move so fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, but yeah. you are relaxed. And, uh, you have yeah. you have done so well. We we thank God, and thank you for reminding us that uh, you know scriptures were not written to uh, ask kikuyus or lose or kisses. You know the same uh -huh. way we when we are preaching we say kama mile paulo alitwambia siku ingine. It's very important. <laughs> to acknowledge that there was a, an audience that, that were the first. Yeah. And, you know, I'm looking at this whole list and, um, you know, there was a time that people used to scrum for the pulpit. Uh, everybody thought they would preach and, uh, and, and, and sometimes there would be fights. But looking at this work, I think people will now uh, humbly uh, keep up <laughs> these fights. So hard work. I, yeah, hard work, hard work, hard, hard work. Uh, now that we do not have, uh, uh, I see someone raising a hand, and uh, um, I, I think we can take this last question. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe uh, Elder Susan wants to uh, wants to uh, verbally. Uh, we can take this uh, last one and uh, maybe have uh, any conclusive remarks. Uh, welcome. Okay. Uh, Elder Susan Gitao, you have your hand raised. I don't know whether this is current or this has already been sorted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I would assume that- oh, uh, she, says, um, she says she's okay. She says Susan, she's okay. I'm okay, thanks. Okay, fine. I, I want to uh, take this opportunity and welcome uh, Elder, Elder Meshak. I don't know whether he's here already uh, to, to uh, move a vote of thanks. Then I, I will come back for final remarks. Yes, I am in Rev. Thank you. And I, um, I take this opportunity to really say that uh, indeed this was a, a wonderful way of spending a Friday evening. 
would not have spent it in a in a better way than this learning the word of god and how to how to properly and or rightfully preach the word of god and uh, i take this opportunity to thank each one of us for making this uh, successful because uh, it would not have been successful without uh, without participants or without uh, facilitators so each one of us has played a critical role including logging in and listening in attentively so we really really appreciate you and uh reverend wilson this would not have been delivered in a better way indeed we we, we, we are transformed we, we we are empowered and i believe going forward we'll be able to properly preach and expose the word of god as we should as we as god intended us to do it i take this opportunity to thank uh, Reverend Arfaxa Chege, the parish minister, Kirigiti Parish, for thinking about this. Indeed, this is wonderful. Uh, it's transforming us. And uh, we have people who have logged in from across the country, and we thank them. So Reverend Chege, God bless you for thinking about this and hosting this. So be blessed. So uh, as I conclude, everybody else, uh, everyone from whatever you log you're logged in from from whichever uh, whichever uh, community of believers you come from. Feel appreciated, and may God bless you. Uh, and we look forward to once again uh, linking up next Friday. God bless you. Oh. Amen. Thank you. Back to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elder Meshak. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that uh, uh, very well uh, summarized uh, word of thanks. Um, Yes, thank you so much for all your messages. I, I, I can see them and uh, I, I don't uh, know how to, I'm not able to read all of them. I can see you, uh, Elder Veronica, uh, Elder Margaret, uh, Richard Okabi. Uh, so many people have uh, sent their messages uh, and uh, we, we are going to save them somewhere uh, because of lack of time. And we promise that uh, we are going to be having more time in the coming week uh, so that uh, uh, we will be able to read everybody's message. So once again, thank you so much, Reverend Wilson. Uh, we will definitely some other time as the Lord wills. And um, it's it's important for me to remind you about the coming week. Um, now, Reverend uh, Wilson uh, spoke about uh, getting a session where we can deal with the uh, false teachers and, and true teachers. And I think uh, this coming week, uh, I think the speaker will touch on that a bit uh, because he's going to be speaking to us about the true gospel versus the false gospel. Yeah, how do you, how are you able to distinguish between what is false and what is truth, uh, what is truthful? So, so uh, I'm really, really looking forward to next week as we continue to build up on what has been laid uh, down by Reverend Nelson and Wilson. And uh, so next week, uh, we, uh, we uh, l l let's, let's get prepared for that. And uh, like I said, we will, not be, we will not be as limited as we were today, much as uh, the Lord has helped us to benefit so much uh, within that short time. So the link is going to be sent immediately uh, after this. I see there is a link somewhere on chat, the link for uh, next week's session. But as we have always done, we are going to put the, the, the meeting ID and the passcode on the poster uh, so that if you have a Zoom application, it will be very, very easy for you to log in. And, uh, and like I said, we, we already have the recorded uh, uh, presentation of last week's session, session one uh, on YouTube. And uh, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure whether it's on Facebook, I can be corrected. And so that means that today's session has also been recorded, so it will also be available. Uh, on our social media platforms. So once again, I wish you well. God bless you. I hope to see you uh, next week, same time, 7 p.m., and uh, the Lord will continue to speak to us. So I want to invite you once again, Reverend, uh, to, uh, to just uh, pray for us. Sure. So let's pray. In prayer, mighty God, our Father, through Christ Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to reason together, to share together on how we can faithfully share your word with your people. It is our prayer that through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, you would 
cause all of us to work hard in exposing scriptures that you would convict all of us to be faithful to your word and to be excited for your word oh lord and above all that we would make christ known even as we know him all the more bless these dear ones oh lord and bless all of us even as we look forward to next week we ask that by your grace you would bless the speaker and prepare him and that father all this truth would be hidden in our hearts and that lord your name will be glorified this is our prayer of faith in jesus name amen 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 asante sana kwaherini and uh, have a blessed night good night everybody and thank you for the opportunity amazing you're welcome thank you Good night to God bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank right. you Good night. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Peter. God Good bless night. You. Thank you. Asante sana. Hello, Susan. Asante. <laughs> <laughs>